The other day, I was visiting the Electric Starship Arcade in Haltom City, Texas. Now, this is one of many arcades we have operating in the Dallas Fort Worth area. Now, these new arcades generally have their machines set to free play mode, so unlike in the past, none of the machines require coins or tokens, which means you can just walk up to them and start playing. They do charge an entrance fee of $10, though and they also serve drinks and food. So it's a very different business model from the arcades of the 80s. So you don't have to carry around a bag of coins, <laughs> and maintenance is certainly easier since 90% of the failures of these machines back in the day was with the coin slot mechanisms. Anyway, as I was playing, it got me to wondering if it might be possible to do a Petsky Robots arcade machine. Better yet, when completed, if I'd be able to place my arcade here next to the classics for people to play. So I managed to track down Mike Woods, the owner of the arcade, and pitched my idea to him, and he liked the idea and agreed to host my machine here, at least for a while. So I started thinking about how to build the arcade. There were a number of challenges that I'd have to deal with. Uh, first of all was selecting a platform, as in, what's going to be the brains of this arcade? What's it actually going to run on? And whatever that is, it also needs to be able to interface with arcade controls and a CRT monitor, because uh, I really wanted to use a traditional CRT so that it would feel very authentic to like the 1980s. And of course, what sort of software changes would need to be made? And of course, don't forget the challenge of building the cabinet itself. I really liked the idea of the Commodore 128 version, but I couldn't think of any way to accomplish dual monitors in the type of arcade cabinet I wanted. And another problem is connecting it to an arcade-style CRT, which usually requires an RGB signal. The MS-DOS version could be a great contender since any old PC motherboard from the 90s or early 2000s would work fine. Trouble is, it isn't finished yet and probably won't be for months. Um, I also considered the Sega Genesis version, which is complete now. So that being said, I decided on the Amiga version of the game. I think the Amiga version probably looks and sounds the best of all ports so far. Plus, it has a map that can be toggled to the main screen, so no need for a second monitor like the C128. The Amiga also has another big advantage, and as you can see here, I bought a 19-inch arcade monitor. Uh, this one is new old stock. Now, these monitors essentially use the same RGB video signal as the Amiga outputs so it makes a perfect match. No conversion is necessary. In fact, some arcade machines actually used Amiga motherboards inside, and here is such an example. I was looking at this Mad Dog McCree arcade, and I noticed a familiar looking power supply down in the bottom. And uh, so I took a peek inside, and what do I see? Yep, that is an Amiga 500 motherboard in there. And top it off, I have this old Amiga 500 that's in serious disrepair. Uh, besides the fact that the case and keyboard look terrible, the keyboard itself doesn't work at all. Uh, literally not a single key will show up. Uh, the keyboard is controlled by this little microcontroller, and I found that if I used a piece of wire to jump some of the matrix connections, I can indeed get letters to appear on the screen. So I think the microcontroller is good. I disassembled the keyboard down to this little thin membrane, and um, even though I can't visually see anything wrong with it, when I use the meter to check for conductivity, I find that there are broken traces all over the membrane, like dozens of them, uh, enough to make it so that not a single key will register. So I think it's safe to say that there's probably no way to repair the keyboard. Interestingly enough, the computer itself actually works. In fact, if I insert the disc, it will boot right up to Petsky Robots and I can play it with a gamepad, no problem. I had planned to do a restoration on this computer, but now I think I'll just remove the motherboard from this case and make it into my dedicated arcade machine. I've decided to use the keyboard controller as the input device. I considered using the joystick ports, but there just really aren't enough pins for all the buttons, even if I used both ports. So I just decided to interface the buttons to the keyboard controller. Of course, unlike most arcade control setups where all the buttons share a common ground, in this case, I'm dealing with a keyboard matrix. Uh, these are all of the buttons I need to create and where they are on the key matrix. So for example, if I wanted to register an M being pressed, I need to cross column PC7 with row X6. On the bright side, uh, this is the joystick I'm going to use for movement. It will be taking the place of the cursor keys on the keyboard. And you may notice it only has five pins because it expects a common ground for all of the switches. Fortunately, if you look at the matrix diagram again, you'll notice all four cursor keys reside on the same column PC0. So that works out perfectly. And so TechSelect built me this little interface board that attaches the uh, to the keyboard controller and I can attach all of my controls here to these terminal blocks. And 
And of course, this is just a mock-up of the controls. Uh, obviously, the final arcade will look nicer than this, but uh, the main thing here is that at least all of the controls will be labeled, so uh, that will mitigate the need for a user's manual to some extent. Um, also, I thought about using two joysticks like you have on Robotron, uh, one for moving and one for firing. But honestly, uh, this game isn't nearly as much of an action game as some people think. Uh, in fact, you'll spend far more time searching and moving objects than you will firing at things. So I decided to go with this four directional buttons for firing. So I asked Vesa, the developer behind the Amiga version, if he could make a few changes to the game just for the arcade. Uh, first of all, I'm going to be putting in a two megabyte memory expansion. And one of the things that he's uh, done is made it so that it loads all maps and all music and decompresses it all uh, from the very initial load. So it never has to access the disk drive again after the first load. Also, if somebody walks away from the game after about 90 seconds, it'll just return to the main menu because, you know, people do that all the time in arcades. And there's also going to be some kind of either screensaver or tracked mode or something like that uh, to keep it from burning the CRT in, uh, sitting at the main menu all the time. Uh, so, uh, but that hasn't been implemented yet, but that, that should be done here in the next few weeks. So there'll be a follow-up video on my brother's channel, The Geek Pub, where we finish up building the arcade machine and then install it in the Electric Starship Arcade. The game may actually end up moving around from time to time, so I've also decided there's going to be a dedicated place on my website where it will keep track of where the uh, Pesky Robots Arcade is at the moment, so if you ever happen to be in the Dallas-Fort Worth area and you want to play it, you'll know where you can find it. But for now, I need to catch you up on all of the computer and console ports that are in progress, and there are a bunch. You might be surprised to learn that the same developer for the Amiga version also created a PlayStation Portable version. It will work on any PSP as long as you have a decently new firmware. Uh, no hacking or modding is required. You can just copy it right onto a memory stick and start playing. Um, obviously, this version is sold only as a digital download, but uh, it is available in the web store. So notice I'm showing the map on here. And speaking of maps, I want to talk about that. The first versions to have a map uh, were the Commodore 128 version, which used uh, dual monitors for the map, and the Plus 4 version, which came out around the same time. After playing these versions, I decided that we needed a map on all versions going forward, and I wanted to backport that feature to all of the ports that had already been released. So let's take a look at some of them. Here is the Commodore Pet version, and uh, since we have no graphics mode, the map is generated from Petsky block characters. And uh, it won't even fit on the screen at once, so you have to scroll around with the cursor keys to see the whole map, but it works. Besides the addition of the map, uh, the Pet version also can use a custom character ROM, which uh, gives it a little bit nicer looking graphics than a stock pet. The Apple II also got a map feature, but it does require a 128K system with an 80 column card because it uses double low res graphics mode. <laughs> and for those that don't know, uh, the low res and double low res modes are the only way to display all 16 colors on an Apple II. And so we take advantage of that here, but uh, interestingly enough, it ends up having about the same map resolution as the pet version. Uh, so you do have to scroll around to see the whole map. Uh, nevertheless, it works pretty well. The C64 version was a bit more challenging to do since uh, there wasn't enough free RAM available to even initialize a bitmap graphics screen, so we ended up creating a map out of 128 characters grouped together in a little block and then redefining those. And it's kind of small, but it is fully functional showing where the robots are with blinking dots. However, the bigger update to the C64 was when Scott Robison, the coder for the C128 version of the game, ported his version to the C64 REU, or RAM Expansion Unit. This version comes on either a double-sided 1541 disc or a 1581 disc. It loads all of the graphics into the REU and uses the DMA to blit it to the screen very quickly. So while it uses all the same graphics assets as the C128 version, it actually runs quite a bit smoother since the REU does the heavy lifting of copying the graphics tiles over to the screen RAM. And since we have no dual monitor set up, the map is displayed by pressing the F7 key. And it is presented in four shades of gray. And you can press F7 again to see the robots. And the RU version also has the little Easter egg where you can change the player color scheme by pressing F8. The RU version has been done for a while and is available in the web store. So, let's talk about some other new releases. Uh, Shiru created a port for the Sinclair ZX Spectrum. However, due to the limited RAM available, it ends up being presented in monochrome. Although he did manage to add some cool sound effects. Alternatively, there is another version, uh, which is part of the same download, that does have color, but achieves this by using smaller tiles, so you get kind of a zoomed out view of the game. But it does work, 
Uh, this version is also available in the web store. And now let's talk about the Sega Genesis. Genesis? Genesis. It's Genesis. Genesis, what's that? Now, this version was just recently completed. It looks just about identical to the Amiga version as it uses all of the same graphics, but it has its own unique FM-based soundtrack, which sounds totally amazing. The Genesis has a few other notable features. Uh, for one thing, it supports three different types of controllers, including the uh, Sega Master System controller. But more importantly, it includes a two-player mode. This is the only version of the game that supports this. As you can see, it works in split screen, and it is a cooperative play, so both players work towards the same goal. This version is code complete. Uh, we're in the process now of printing off labels and programming the ROM chips. Uh, my brother has a large format vinyl printer, so I'm using that to make the labels. And uh, this machine here cuts them out. Um, here's the first hundred made up. I have a few hundred more to make, and uh, we're still waiting on boxes and manuals to be printed, but uh, I've gone ahead and made this version available for sale as a pre-order on my website. It should start shipping very shortly. All right, so now let's talk about some ports that are not yet complete, and I'll start with the NES version. And while I have my NES out, I wanted to briefly show you Montezuma's Revenge. Uh, this is a prototype sent to me directly by Rob Jager, the author of the original game. And believe it or not, there's never been a Nintendo version of Montezuma's Revenge till now. And it even has a soundtrack. Uh, they're doing a Kickstarter on this at the moment, so if you want in on that, I'll also add a link to that in the description. But anyway, back to my NES game. Now I've shown this one before, um, it's still making progress, but there's a lot left to do. Now this is the actual cartridge design, which is uh, designed and manufactured by Texelec. It's uh, quite a complex cartridge since it needs to have a RAM, two ROMs, a mapper chip, and a lockout security chip. It won't currently fit in the shell because uh, we have the ROMs in the sockets, so there isn't any room. So I have to put it into my Nintendo like this uh, in order to test it. Alternatively, um, I have also been using one of the aftermarket top loaders, which uh, does help alleviate that problem. And of course, here's what the game looks like. The title screen changes colors depending on the difficulty level. And we also have a little jukebox here to let you listen to the various songs. Although at the moment, uh, these are the wrong song names uh, for what you're hearing, but that'll be fixed. The game itself, as you can see, is presented in grayscale. Now I've shown this before, and there was a lot of confusion as to why that is. Well, much like the Atari version, the hardware on the NES is not a good fit for this game, and I'll show you why. Let's look at your typical NES game. Now, um, let's get rid of the player sprite as it's not really relevant to the discussion. So just looking at the background, it is essentially made up of 32 by 30 characters. Um, there's no bitmap graphics on the NES. Everything is made up of characters, or tiles, if you will. Um, and the characters contain four different colors. The trouble is, the screen is broken up into color cells, much like the C64, but the main difference is the NES color cells are 16 by 16 pixels, making them a group of four characters. And as you can see, pretty much every game on the NES is designed around this color cell setup. Well, Petsky Robots uses tiles that are 24 by 24 pixels, uh, made up of nine characters each. So, unfortunately, this layout is fundamentally incompatible. In order for this to work, we'd need the color attribute cells to be either half the size or 50% larger, uh, like this, in order to fit. Uh, so, theoretically, we could give a different palette to each cell. Of course, it doesn't have to be these colors. This is just a mock-up, but in a paint program. But, you get the idea. We actually experimented with making these tiles smaller so they would fit, but that presented a whole new list of challenges that I'm not going to go into. So uh, what we did was we just made all of the cells the same four shades of gray, so it has kind of a Game Boy look to the graphics. Now, I know there's probably a ton of you that are going to be rushing to the comments to tell me about the MMC5 mapper. Okay, so the thing is, we know about the MMC5 mapper. Yes, that would solve a lot of our problems. However, it is not available. We cannot find uh, the MMC5 mapper, at least not in any quantity. I mean, we need hundreds, if not thousands of them. So we're not gonna like pull them out of Super Mario Brothers 3 cartridges or, you know, something insane like that. And we can't even find an FPGA emulation of the MMC5 mapper. Now, even if you were to come uh, with some magical solution and tell me where I can suddenly today find 
thousands of MMC5 mappers, or if you were to tell me, oh yeah, there is an FPGA emulation, the reality is we're so far along in development, at this point, it just, it doesn't matter. It's pretty much set in stone, so <laughs> it's going to be, it is what it is. Now, one other neat thing that we're doing with the NES is offering an SNES controller along with the game. Uh, this is also manufactured by Texelec just for this game, although it will actually work with any NES game uh, using just some of the buttons. The software has to be aware of the SNES controller in order to make use of all of the buttons. Uh, the game will work on a regular NES controller too, but it's a bit more clunky to play this way. The game will auto-detect the controller that you're using and display up at the top of the main intro screen what it has detected. Uh, the NES version will probably be available in about six months. So, moving along, let's take a look at the Atari 7800 version. Now, unfortunately, I can't show you this running on real hardware at the moment because I don't have a physical cartridge yet. Uh, the developer that's working on it does, but uh, it's a custom cartridge that uses 256K and a Pokey chip. <laughs> As you can see, the graphics were borrowed from the C128 version of the game, and Noel created a custom Pokey track, which sounds awesome. This game should be available towards the end of the year. And moving along to yet another console, the Super Nintendo. Again, uh, using the Amiga artwork, uh, the developer here has chosen to rearrange the screen and uh, the user information as an overlay. Uh, this should be done by the end of the year as well. And last but not least, I want to show you the MS-DOS version. Uh, this version is being done by Jim Wright, uh, the same developer that did the Commodore Plus 4 port. And um, we're using the same tracker that was used in Planet X3 for ad-lib music, but it has now been modified to use six ad-lib voices instead of three. And again, a custom soundtrack has been created. The main artwork is also taken from the Amiga version, but I wanted the game to support CGA as well. We tried a number of automated conversions, but it just didn't look very good. So I have spent probably about 30 or 40 hours just going through every tile, every sprite, and converting it by hand from 16 colors down to 4 colors. And I think the result looks fantastic. I mean, as far as CGA graphics go, that is. I don't know for sure what other graphics modes or sound cards will be supported at this point, but I suspect we'll at least do Tandy modes. I also wanted to support digital sample sound effects on the Sound Blaster. And one last thing I wanted to mention is that I do have Petsky Robot soundtrack cassettes available for sale, and in another month or two I will have vinyl records available. These are uh, test pressings they sent me for me to approve, and uh, I labeled the center of them, but uh, they still don't have any proper sleeves. Uh, I'll probably give these away at uh, one of my upcoming conventions as some sort of prize, but uh, like I said, the real inventory should be arriving in the next few weeks. I wish I could have gone into a little bit more detail on the design challenges of each of these ports, but uh, that would have probably required a separate video for each platform. And a lot of people were complaining that I was making too many pesky robots videos, so I've just crammed it all into this one video, so it is what it is. But there'll be at least uh, one follow-up to this, which I mentioned before, uh, which is going to be on my brother's channel, and there will be a link down in the description when that goes live. And... Um, Basically, that's going to cover the construction of the cabinet and then installing the cabinet at the actual local arcade that I talked about. There's also going to be another video, which I'm not going to... Uh, there's not going to be any notifications when I put this video. I'm just going to kind of silently upload it to my channel and put it in this playlist. But I've been meaning to do it for a long time, which is just going to be a basic like instructional how-to, like how to play this game. Because a lot of the people um, don't read the manual. <laughs> And so they don't really understand how this game is supposed to be played. And it's not, it's, this is not Commando, this is not Robotron, you know, it's a little bit more, okay, it's a lot more complex. And you really kind of need to know how the game plays. And I even see a lot of the YouTubers out there uh, reviewing my game, and they, they'll they even tell you up front, oh, and I didn't read the manual. And then, of course, they don't know what they're doing. The game looks either boring or it looks too difficult because they, they don't actually understand how the gameplay is supposed to work. So I'm going to make a little tutorial explaining all that. Watch it if you want. If you don't, that's fine. Like I said, I'm not even going to have a notification for it, but uh, it will uh, be there. And I'll put a link down in the description for that as well. But that about wraps it up for this uh, episode. So as always, thanks for watching.